In this video, we'll be looking at how to record and mix acoustic guitar using five different methods. Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. So lots of people ask me about the best way to record acoustic guitar, but the truth is there really is no one best way to do this. It really depends on the particular song you're recording and what kind of sound you want for that song. So in today's video, I've put together five different approaches to recording acoustic guitar and they all give quite different results. Now I'm gonna be going through the actual setting up of the microphone itself to get the raw sound, but I'll also importantly be looking at how I process that sound in my DAW, so stick around for all of that. Now I will be going through them in a kind of a rough order for me, from my least favourite to my most favourite at the end, but of course, as I say, it really does depend on what you want for your particular song at the time. Now before I get into the first approach, if this is your first time here and you like this kind of content all about home recording, DAWs, gear reviews, plug-in reviews, that kind of thing, then please do subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you are notified about my other videos. Now let's take a look at the first approach for recording acoustic guitar. One. So the first method is my least favorite and I don't use it all that often. However, it is mentioned quite often by other people as their kind of go-to method for recording acoustic guitar in the studio. So it's very much worthy of mention and worth you hearing. And the method is to use a Shaw SM57 pointed at around about the 12th to 15th fret of the guitar, or maybe even down here on this part of the guitar as well, that can work well. You have to try different Different positions with all of these different microphone methods. Now there are some pros to this method which I will talk about and in my opinion some cons as well which mean it isn't my kind of go-to method generally. So what are the pros of this? It's a dynamic microphone so it picks up sounds really well which are very very close to it and not things which are far away and that can be very useful for a few reasons. First of all if you're in an untreated room where you haven't got any sound treatment or anything on the walls and you've tried to condense a microphone but you're finding that you're getting those reflections too much and you don't like the sound because of that. Now similarly, it can be useful if you've got some background noise in the room, things like say computer fans or even maybe some external noises like traffic outside of your room. Again, it can be very useful for that because it's only going to focus on the guitar and not so much things in the background. And a third really good reason for trying this out is if you're recording the acoustic guitar and a vocal at the same time and you want to get a little bit more separation than you generally get when you're using condenser microphones. Phones. I've tried that with varying success. Now I do find with this particular method it's useful if the guitar is in the mix with lots of other instruments but I think it really falls short when the guitar is exposed and I think you're going to hear that in a moment. To get it to sound good when the guitar is exposed then you really have to do quite a bit of processing in my opinion and if you do have a condenser microphone handy and you're not too bothered about the sound of your room or it's sounding good to you then I would prefer to go that way. But you be the judge, have a listen to this, let me know in the comments how you think it sounds. So I'm gonna play it first of all without any processing at all, just the sound coming from the microphone and then I'll show you how I treat it in the DAW. So I really do feel that with this particular microphone, it's best used when the guitar is in the mix with other instruments. It's got a nice presence to it, but it doesn't sound all that refined. However, we can improve upon that in our DAW, and that's what I'm gonna run through with you now. Now I'm using Cakewalk, but you could be using any DAW. They're all capable of doing the things I'm gonna show you in this particular tutorial. Now let's have a listen to this guitar to remind ourselves just to see how it sounds without any effects applied to it whatsoever. Whatsoever. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the first thing I almost always do is add an EQ in my effects chain. So I'm using the Fab Filter Pro Q3 EQ. You don't have to use this EQ, of course. It's got no special capabilities that I'll be using today that you can't find in just about any EQ available to you, including the stock one, which probably comes with your DAW or some free ones out there. Now, the first thing I like to do is add a low cut filter, which you can see here, sometimes called a high pass filter. And what this does is it just gets rid of all the mud and the unneeded frequencies right down at the bottom. There's some stuff down here that we can't even hear, and there's some stuff right at the very low end of the guitar where you get this kind of a rumble, sometimes a bit of a boom. So I'm just rolling that off there fairly steeply. Now you'll see that all of the other nodes that I've got in these uh, in the EQ here all go downwards. They're all subtractive EQ. And that's because that's the first thing I like to do. I like to find the frequencies in the guitar which I'm not liking the sound of, and I like to cut them down. Now, normally with a condenser microphone, I will tend to be having fairly narrow bands, a, a fairly small Q value, and I'll be selecting narrow bands. But with this particular microphone, I'm making slightly wider grabs of frequencies and pulling them down. Let's see which ones I chose and why. So I'm gonna solo some of these, this top one at the beginning first of all. So let's just make sure everything's switched on. I'll play the guitar and solo this frequency. So you can hear there, that's a kind of what I would call the cheap part of the guitar. It just sounds not quite boxy, but just very overly twangy. So I've just cut that down by about oh, two to three decibels there with a fairly wide cue there. So I'm grabbing quite a few frequencies either side. Now moving on to this next one down here, let's have a listen to this. That's where the boxiness is. You'll almost always find some boxy frequencies on an acoustic guitar, which you want to subtract. I guess that could change if you had some very, very expensive microphones and some very expensive uh, guitars, but I'm almost always finding that I'm looking for a boxy frequency. I found one there and I've reduced it with, oh, as I say, a wider cue than I would normally use perhaps on my condenser microphones. Now moving down, I've got some slightly unusual ones here. So I'll go to this one, have a listen to this. Okay, this is where I felt there was a bit of a, a slight boom to the guitar. I could probably pull that down a little bit more to reduce it a bit more, but I've got a fairly wide cue on there. Let's have a It's not on all of the chords I play, but on some of them you can really hear it sort of boom through. So that's just to control those a little bit. Again, I've just done a two to three decibel reduction there. And then I can see I've got a bit of a notch here. I can't remember what this was for. Let's have a listen and I will find out. I'll solo it. Sorry, wrong one. Okay, yeah. So there's a sort of a boomy frequency that's got a bit of a ring to it there, and I've just fairly aggressively reduced that. Okay. So usually I'll do that kind of subtractive EQing to a guitar, and then I'll be looking at which frequencies I want to boost, which ones I like. And there's often some broad ones in the lower end and some broadly some in the top end where the kind of air is. Now it does really depend on the microphone and the guitar you're using as to how much you want to add. But instead of using EQ to do this, I'm actually gonna use a different plugin, which is the next one I've got in the chain. And this one is called um, Magnetic. Too. It's basically a tape saturation or a tape warmer plugin, and it does have the ability to boost some low and high frequencies, and that's often what I'm looking to do here. But it does it in a really sort of transparent, natural way, I find, um, and it really works for me. Sometimes I do use EQ for this, but in this case, I am going ahead and using this one. So I've just added a little bit to the low end of this, and I've just added a little bit of sparkle to the high. Not big moves here just sort of little increases here and I've added some tape saturation. Let's see how the guitar sounds before and after I add this plug-in. So let's have a quick listen. I'll switch it on now.
Okay, it's fairly subtle, but it is there, and I think it just makes a nice difference to the guitar there. So next in the chain, I have a compressor, and I've got a bit of a love-hate uh, relationship with compressors and acoustic guitars. Um, quite often I don't use a compressor at all on an acoustic guitar. I think it does a good job of destroying them. Um, but when I do use it, I like to be as transparent as possible. And the way I've made it transparent in this case is actually by using a fairly sort of low ratio. I'm getting probably around about three to four dB of reduction. Um, but because I've got that sort of low ratio, it's, it's sort of fairly subtle. I'll go through some of the other controls as well just so you can understand what's happening. But let's have a quick listen with it switched on. So you can see I'm getting about, uh, yeah, around about 3 dB of reduction there. I've got the attack um, not too fast. If you make the attack too fast, then you kind of kill all of that sort of plectrum sound on the strings that you get. And I wanted to keep that. I like that sort of percussive nature of an acoustic guitar. And then um, I've got a fairly fast release happening as well. So it just grabs anything which peaks up above um, the threshold and then it just lets go again so that we don't feel like the guitar is just being crushed by the compressor. Now what you'll often find with presets for acoustic guitars is that the ratio is uh, by in the preset set a lot higher than I have here. I've got this uh, 1.61 to 1 ratio. So what I generally will be doing is starting off with the ratio down at one, so it's just not doing anything at all. I play the guitar and then I gradually push this up till it's just making some subtle difference. So I'm definitely getting some compression, but you don't really notice it. And that's the sound that I like. But some people like the sound of a compressed guitar and they can hear that compression. If you do like it, that's absolutely fine. Now, the last thing I've got in the chain here, I'll just remind myself what I have got. Ah, yes. This one's a little bit unusual. I won't often have this at the end of the chain. Here, I've just done some final corrections um, using this EQ. And I'm tackling an area which is sort of very specific, I find, to this particular microphone phone where it does sound a little bit too harsh and a little bit too present. Let's uh, solo this particular frequency and have a listen. And I've got a very, very wide cue there as well. And I think that just smooths off the final result. So let's have a listen to what we've got so far. I'm going to switch all of those off. And then I'm going to play the guitar and after a, a couple of bars, I'll switch them all on, see what difference you can hear. Switching it on. Okay, so I feel like I've smoothed that out as much as I can at the moment. I could probably do a little bit of work on the bottom end of things. It's perhaps a little bit boomy here and there, but I'm happy with it for now. Now, the next thing I want to do is just add a little bit of space to this guitar so it doesn't sound like it's too close to you. So I'm putting a little bit of reverb on it. Now, a quick word on reverb. It's quite a handy effect to use, especially when the guitar is by itself. But when the guitar is in the mix with other instruments and you apply reverb, sometimes what can happen is um, rather than just putting it in space, you probably feel like it's being pushed away from you. It gets kind of lost in the mix. So I, I use reverb when the guitar is by itself, but a good thing to try out is to use delay instead of reverb if you feel like your guitar is kind of disappearing into the mix. But today, because the guitar is by itself, I'm just gonna use reverb. Now, what I'm using is this Lexicon Concert Hall reverb, which I'll pull up here. This is one of my favorites. This is not over the top, it feels fairly controlled. I've got a little bit of pre-delay happening on there, about 40 milliseconds, so it's just waiting a bit before it kicks in. And something I often do, almost always do, before I send things uh, to reverb, is put in um, a bit of an EQ in the chain. So I've got my Fab Filter um, Pro 3 EQ here, or Pro Q3 EQ, whatever it was. And as you can see, I've got a fairly aggressive low cut filter. So basically, 
basically, I don't really want any of the bottom end or any of the low mids to go through to the reverb, just the higher end of things. Because if you just send everything through to the reverb, you often find it starts to sound quite muddy, quite quickly. So that's the way I'm using reverb there. And I'm gonna let you listen to the whole thing with all of those effects switched on and the reverb switched on. And this, I think, is the best I can do with this particular microphone at the moment. So this method is much more what I would call my go-to method of recording acoustic guitar. I've got a Rode NT1A here pointed at around about the 12th to 15th fret of the guitar. Again, a similar sort of area and anything from sort of 6 to 14 inches away, depending on the style of guitar being played, the song and the kind of sound that I want to get. You have to definitely experiment with different positions for different sounds. Now, why do I like this method? I think a condenser microphone has much more detail in it out of the box without having to do much to it compared to the SM57 that we used before. I will be doing some processing, but it feels much more like fun to process with a microphone like this. I'm not trying to squeeze every last ounce out of the microphone itself, but I'm generally, from the actual recording, getting a decent enough sound and then just refining it. So I'm gonna go ahead and record it and let you hear it again with just the raw microphone before we go into the DAW and refine find that sound just a little bit more. Okay, so this is gonna be much quicker to run through this one because I've done a lot of things the same as the last one, but let's have a look at the differences. Now, I do find that this guitar is much easier to process. I didn't find I have to work so hard to make it sound the way I want it to sound. Now, let's have a quick listen to a couple of bars to remind ourselves how it does sound without any effects on there. Okay, so again, I've started off with an EQ. I'll just switch that on. And again, I've done a low cut on there and I've found some frequencies I didn't like too much and I've done a little bit of subtractive EQing. Moving on from there, again, I've used this magnetic uh, plugin here to add a little bit of the bottom end in there and just a tad of a high end, although I wasn't too sure about that, but we'll have a listen to it in a moment. I've added some saturation in there as well. So let's have a listen. So it is a bit of a feature of this microphone that the top end can get a little bit out of control and if you boost it too much it can be really really irritating so you've got to be a little bit careful with it. Now next in the chain I have the same compressor again so I won't be mentioning this too much now guys because I'm basically using the same compressor settings across the board for all of the guitars. The same settings as I had for the last guitar, very subtle use of compression. And then finally in the chain here, I have another EQ. And I use this to control that top end, which I did find was a little bit too sparkly. And I've put a shelf in there and I've just done a little bit of reduction there, just one and a half dB or so uh, above sort of two, 2,700 Hertz or so. So let's have a listen to see what we've got so far. Okay, it's only subtly different from how the microphone was sounding, but sometimes it's the subtleties which count for a lot. And then I've gone and sent it through to a very, very similar e uh, reverb that I did um, in the last example. Just to remind you, um, I've used this Lexicon Concert Hall uh, reverb, and I've also just before it put an EQ and done a low cut going into that reverb. And then I've just subtly added it using the send control here. So let's have a listen to this guitar now that I've added all of those effects and I've added that little bit of reverb on the end and let's see how it sounds now.
three. So whenever I'm in a situation where the song comprises mostly of a vocal and a guitar alone, this is definitely my go-to method to record the guitar because I want the guitar to sound much more lush and wide because it's going to be probably the only instrument in the song. So for this method, I'm actually using a pair of microphones. In fact, I'm using a matched pair of Rode NT5 small condenser microphones and they're arranged in what is called an XY configuration. I've got the capsules as close together as I can get them and one is pointing over here towards the bridge of the guitar and the other one is pointing up here towards the neck of the guitar and they've got quite a different sound to them and that's a good thing whenever you're creating a stereo image of guitars it's best to give the left and the right channel at least slightly different characters now I'm going to go ahead and let you hear how this sounds just the raw sound without any processing at all and then we're going to jump into our DAW and see how we can make them even more sweet So it won't surprise you to know that I'm using very much the same effects chain as I was using before with the other guitars, but we do get a big difference in sound with this particular recording by the mere fact that we were using two microphones and we've got that stereo image. So again, let's have a very quick listen to it without any effects applied. Okay, so my effects chain starts off just the same as all the other guitars. Much more simple, there wasn't much I wanted to do in this particular one, a little bit of subtractive EQ there. Again, the low cut in there. Also, again, I went to this magnetic uh, plugin here. I chose to use a little bit more warmth pushed in there and a little bit more brilliance than I would normally use, but I felt that the guitar could handle it in this case. And then also at the end of uh, that, we just have the compressor, same settings as before, and I didn't use any other plugins in the chain before I went off to the reverb. So let's have a quick listen before we do add the reverb in. So if it was just a guitar and a vocal, that could really handle it quite well, I feel. Now I'm going to send it off to the reverb, and this, in this case, I decided to use a slightly larger reverb. I'm using the Lexicon uh, Random Hall. This is a little bit bigger than the previous one I was using, but I'm just kind of subtly sending it through using the um, send over here. So let's have a listen to this guitar now that I've added all of those particular plugins to it. So this method is really exciting because it doesn't involve you having lots of equipment. You can do this with the minimal amount of equipment, but you can get a very, very nice result indeed. What we're actually going to do is layer some guitars. We've already actually got one recording which we're going to use, and that was the recording I made earlier, just with one large diaphragm condenser microphone. I'm now going to record that part and play it in exactly the same way, but once for the left speaker and once for the right speaker, and then we're going to blend those together and you get a very very nice result as you're going to see when we get to the door but for now I'm just going to let you hear how it sounds when I record just one recording on top of another without doing any panning Okay, so that really did sound a little bit odd, and that's because we had one guitar, which is a duplicate, and it was put right down the middle with the original guitar, and it almost sounds like there's some weird sort of phase issues going on. The magic really happens with this method when you've got two duplicates, and you pan one hard left and one hard right, and that's what I've got just here. You can see my original guitar on the first track here, and I've got a double, which is panned all the way over to the left, and another double guitar, which is panned all the way over to the 
the right. Now, what I'm gonna start off by doing is blending those ones in with the original track, and then I'm gonna explain the effects chain. So I'll just grab both of them. I'm gonna play the track and just blend them into, I think it gets to a level which I like. Okay, I think I like it right there. Just sounds really nice and wide. Now I could stop there, but there's some nice tweaks I can do. If we look at the effects chain, it's almost identical on both of these to what we've already discussed. So we start off with an EQ, with a low cut and the notches there for frequencies we don't like. Then went on to use this Magnetic 2 plugin, which I'd used before. Basically I'm using that to add some low and some high frequencies and a little bit of tape saturation. And then I moved on to the compressor but at the end of the chain on each of these I've got an EQ and it's playing a very specific role so if we open it up on this left hand guitar you'll see that I've chosen a couple of frequencies here and these are a couple of frequencies which I actually quite liked this one's a nice high frequency adds a little bit of sparkle I've just boosted it by you know sort of one and a half dB they're just a nice little boost there and down here I like some of these middle frequencies and I've actually reduced it and you'll be thinking why have you reduced it well there is a method to my madness let's take a look at the second one You'll see on the right hand guitar here, I've chosen the same frequencies, but with the low to middle one, instead of reducing it, I've actually boosted it. But with the high one, I've reduced it, whereas in the other one, I boosted it. So they're kind of a, if I flick between the two of them, they're kind of a mirror image of each other. And this is really important. When you've got guitars panned hard left and right, it's a good idea to give them very different uh, sort of characters to each other. And you'll find that this makes it sound even more wide. It sounds like, you know, a real nice bit of separation in there. Rather than me ramble on, let's actually have a listen now that I've applied that EQ. Okay, and the last little bit of magic happens when I add the reverb. I'm just gonna switch on my reverb sends here. And I'm gonna explain over on the right hand side what's going on. Let's get rid of my lovely face so you can see what's going on. Okay, so over here I have the original reverb send which I used for my original guitar. That was using this Lexicon Concert Hall reverb. And then I've got another two reverbs here. One is reverb left, one is reverb right. They're both using the random hall which is a, a slightly bigger sounding reverb than the concert hall one. Now you may think that I'll send one of these guitars, the left hand guitar to the left reverb and the other one to the right reverb, but I'm gonna do the opposite to that. What I'm actually doing is the left hand guitar is dry on the left hand side, but it has its reverb coming out of the right hand side. So I've sent it to reverb right, reverb right. And I've done the opposite with the other guitar. And this has a really nice kind of spacious effect when you apply it. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do now. So you can have a listen now to um, this example where I've got, remember the original guitar, two guitars panned left and right using different EQ on each of them, a kind of a mirror image EQ, and also applying um, the reverb in reverse, left to right, right to left. So let's have a listen to see how all of that sounds. Five. So this method is definitely my favorite because I remember the first time I tried it and I felt, wow, something magic just happened and there was no effort on my part whatsoever. Now it's very, very similar to the last method we use in that we're gonna be keeping our original recording that we recorded of the guitar and putting that dead set down the center of the recording. And then we're gonna record a left channel guitar and a right channel guitar. We're gonna be playing exactly the same parts on the guitar, but the difference is the guitar is tuned in a different way. And that's why I've got a different guitar here for this particular part of the video. Now this guitar has been re 
restrung and tuned to what is called Nashville tuning. So what is Nashville tuning? Well, the top two strings, the E and the B, are exactly the same as you have normally. But the bottom four strings, the G, the D, the A and the E, are all tuned one octave higher. Higher. In fact, what I did was I got some strings meant or guitar strings meant for a 12 string guitar and I just used the additional strings that you get in that 12 string set, put them in this guitar and tuned those four strings an octave higher. That means I can use exactly the same fingering for the chords, etc., but I get a different sound and it really does sound quite magical. I'm going to let you hear how it sounds just by adding one of these additional guitars, not really panned left or right, and then in the DAW we'll let the magic happen. So this is the easiest example to explain because it's basically almost identical to the previous example. I've got my duplicate guitars. These are Nashville tuned guitars this time, pan hard left, pan hard right, and blended in with the original guitar. I've also got the same uh, effects chain in there with a slight difference to the EQing here because it is quite a different sounding guitar um, to the sort of normally stringed guitar. So I did uh, do that separately there I didn't just apply the same EQ but the rest of the chain is the same and I did the same right at the end of the chain with these two um, EQs which I have which are kind of mirror images of each other right at the end there and I did just the same with the reverb I've got two extra reverb channels here one left one right and I've sent the left guitar to the right reverb and I've sent the right guitar to the left reverb and all that's left for me to do is play the finished product to you and I'm going to do that right now. So there's definitely many more ways to record acoustic guitar than the five ways that I've shown you today. For example, some people use a wide stereo pair of condenser microphones pointed at each end of the guitar and they find that they get a really nice wide stereo sound from that. Other people try a kind of a player's perspective where they point the microphone over the shoulder and down towards the guitar. And lots of people ask me about plugging the guitar in using the pickup which is built into lots of guitars these days. And that's really a method Method that I don't often recommend. I've never really got a good sound from that. And I think that's because the pickups that they put in guitars are really designed for live situations where it's impractical to point a microphone at a guitar. So we use a pickup instead. And although they've gotten very, very good in recent years, there's still nothing that quite beats a microphone pointing at the actual guitar and getting the authentic sound of an acoustic guitar. Now let me know your favorite methods for recording acoustic guitars if I haven't mentioned them at all here and let me know if you try any of these methods out and you have some successes I'd love to hear about that now if you did like this video you can help me out by making sure that you hit the like button that means that YouTube will show it to many many more people and they'll also get the benefit of this information so thank you in advance for doing that for me now if you like this kind of content all about home recording DAWs gear reviews plug-in reviews that kind of thing then do make sure you subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you are notified about my future videos and I'll see you in the next video.